Will you stand for the reading of God's Word? This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. It said, But the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so complete, so cometh as a thief in the night. For then when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction upon them, as travail, as a woman it, it travails with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light, and the children of the day. We are not the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning that we take these words to heart. Understand that as children that have been saved, we have no uh, worry or no fear about the coming day of the Lord. But anyone that has not prepared has to be afraid. Lord, I pray that today no one would leave this place without coming to your light. Be with our service today. Be with Brother Christian as he brings a message. And Lord, thank you for all that you do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Lynn Taylor. But while you all are standing, we'll go ahead and sing a song. How about that? <laughs> Morning, church. What a great day to be in the Lord's house. We're getting a little bit of rain outside, but it's much needed. Uh, and so uh, thank you for uh, braving the weather to get out to church this morning. Just, just a couple of announcements. Uh, and so first, tonight at 530, our men's fellowship will go on as planned. And so we're going to eat. It doesn't matter what. 
Uh, and so <laughs> if we don't get to uh, shoot some clay pigeons tonight, we're going to have some good time of fellowship. We'll be able to uh, hear a great speaker uh, and to be able to eat some good food. And so come and be a part of that. It's at 530, and that's at the Russell County Sportsman's Club. Uh, and so if you don't know where that's located, it is it's the road beside Arby's. You're going to take that road out to Stevens Pipe and Steel where it splits off there. Uh, there's a road just to your right, Bubby Flanagan Road, and it's down at the end of that road. Uh, if you don't know where I'm talking about, you can get somebody or grab a neighbor and ask them to help you find that or come after church to speak with me or one of the staff uh, and get, get your way there. Also, our 4th of July celebration is July the 2nd, coming right around the corner. Uh, and so we will have great fireworks display, good music and food for that event. Uh, we want to, for you to be there. It is at 630. And so we, and you need, need to bring a chair or a blanket to sit on uh, for that. We have children that are going to be back here in just a little while that have been at our Center Kid camp. Uh, and so Danielle and that group of kids left out on Friday, and they're going to be back here today. I know that they had a great time. And if you look over here to the side, you're going to see some of our youth uh, that came back from uh, youth camp on Friday. They had a great time at camp. We were able to take 97 youth this year to camp. As, praise the Lord. Y'all give them a hand clap for that. I was able to go down on Wednesday and spend the night and stay a good portion of the day on Thursday. And let me just say this about my experience at camp. It is amazing to see young people that are praising the Lord. And to be in those worship sessions where I saw hands raised to the Lord praising Him. I saw them being attentive to the Word of God being preached. And then after their responses to that message and, and just what they got out of it and seeing so many of them share what they got out of those messages was truly amazing to see. I wish everybody could go to camp. I am getting a little bit older and it's a little bit harder for me to do some of the things that I used to do at camp, but I did get out on the rec lake and was able to blob a few um, of the kids and go down some water slides. Uh, we have a video to show you a little bit about what our kids experienced at camp. So if you would draw your uh, attention to the screen.
Well, as you can see, they had a, a great time and, and really had a great time experiencing the Lord and worshiping together. Uh, and so make sure that you ask them about their experience at camp. They have some opportunity to interact with our youth uh, and check out what they have to say about camp. If you have uh, youth that would like to go to camp next year, keep this in mind. And so uh, we'd love to even take a bigger group uh, next year. At this time, I'm going to invite the ushers to come forward. Uh, for our offer. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Father, it is a day to praise you. And Father, let our hearts be aligned this morning to you. Let us experience your presence today. Father, I pray that your word, that is, as it is preached, will, will move us and will help us to be more like your son, Jesus. Father, I thank you for these youth and the opportunity that they had this week. Father, they had a lot of fun. But, Father, I, I pray that the thing that sticks in their hearts and in their minds is the opportunities that they got to hear your word, to respond to your worship. And, Father, I pray that they would... Continue that now that they're back home. Guard over their hearts. Father, the temptations that are in the world are great. Father, help them to be able to resist Satan and his schemes. Father, I'm, I pray this morning that as we take up our tithes and offerings, that they would, it would be from giving hearts, from hearts that understand that, that we give because you have given to us. And Father, let these tithes and offerings be used for the furtherment of your kingdom. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. a mistake. I got up here this morning and I started the service and I didn't welcome you this morning. <laughs> so I want to apologize for that and personally right now welcome you, invite you to come into the service to pour your heart and soul into worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords right now. Will you join us in singing?
Yeah. 
we just come to you this morning, Lord, and we just want to lift your name up. Lord, we just sing praises and want to bring glory to you. And Lord, we just we just stand amazed and we want to be in your presence here this morning here at First Baptist Church. And Lord, just have your way with us, have your way with our hearts. Maybe we'll hear a word, apply it to our, our hearts and our minds and be able to take it out of these doors and into the streets of Russell County and beyond. Lord, just I pray for the lost in here this morning. I pray for the ones that's out of the businesses on one's heart, Lord, that they need to take care of this morning here in your place. Lord, just be, make this place safe for us to come to you with pure and open arms and pure hearts this morning. And we ask these names in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And go ahead, turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. We are continuing our series on the churches in Revelation. We have made it to the fifth church, the church in Sardis. And so turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. I had a coat on when I come in the building this morning, uh, but I got drenched out there, and so I had to throw the coat off. And then I come in here, and, and I don't know who it was. I think it was a church member. I think somebody hid my microphone so I wouldn't preach this morning. If that was you, you can go ahead and confess now. No, here's what happened. I had it Wednesday, and I don't know where I put my ear set, uh, and so I'll take the blame for that one. I'm preaching with the handheld this morning. The Word of God's still going to be preached. Amen? Amen. All right, Revelation chapter 3, the church in Sardis. Uh, here's what we need to know about Sardis before we begin reading uh, Jesus' letter to this church. We want to talk about, and I think it helps us to understand, the setting of the church in Sardis. And so where they were located geographically, where they were at a very high spot. In fact, kind of on a high plateau. They sat about 15 hundred feet above the valley floor. Now, in this time, if you were in a city, uh, and you lived a city in ancient days, and you were at a high point, this was of great military advantage because the high place acted as a shield. At this time, you didn't have, you didn't have guns, and you didn't have missiles. Uh, you didn't, Oppenheimer hadn't been born yet, and so the bomb hadn't been created. Tom Cruise, you didn't have to worry about him flying over your head in, in a fighter a jet. You didn't have to worry about those things. And so if you had the high ground, you had, well, a little bit of sense of security. The church of Sardis had this, what they would call a sense of security. The church of Sardis early on, they became a luxurious city. Uh, they lived lavishly. They had comfortable lifestyles. But then here's what happened. Because of the overconfidence in their position of protection, where they were located geographically, they became complacent. And they, they lost a sense of, of vigilance. They quit watching for the enemies because they thought, they thought well, let's just say this, they thought they were invincible. They thought everything was, was fine. No one could ever attack them because of their high location until around the year, I think it was about 590-ish B.C., we find uh, in 549, excuse me, B.C., King Cyrus comes on to the play. And King Cyrus, he comes along, and, and legend has it that he offered up one of his men a chance that if you found a way to get to Sardis so that we could conquer them, I'll give you a big prize. And so men begin watching, and they be began to, to closely watch Sardis. How can we get up to this city so that we can conquer it? Well, uh, there was a man in Sardis who had really kind of got complacent. And without looking, he took this secret pathway that Sardis had at the time. And one of King Cyrus' men saw this secret passage. He went back and told King Cyrus. And because Sardis quit looking out for the enemy, King Cyrus took his Persian empire. They went up, marched up, and conquered Sardis. And Sardis was never able to recover. You know, a lot of times we learn from our lesson. Sardis never learned from their lesson. In fact, almost 200 years after the conquering from King Cyrus, we see a man approach on the stage named Antiochus the Great. He then conquered the overconfident city once again by more than likely the same route. Because why? Sardis did not sit watch. Now, why do I talk about the setting? The setting of Sardis and their complacency in their, uh, their complacency in where they were at, you know what? It mirrors their spiritual condition. And we're going to see this in this letter to the church. And so uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Here's what God's word says. Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Sardis, 
Write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Jesus says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive. Now, let's talk and let's stop and talk about reputation for a minute. What is reputation? Reputation, it is the beliefs or opinions that are generally held about something or someone. For example, a reputation is Google restaurant reviews, right? When we were out at Orange Beach and I was in New Orleans uh, two weeks ago, you know what? We're constantly Googling restaurant reviews. Here's my thing. If a restaurant's under four stars, I ain't eating there. I don't know about you. If it's under four stars, I- I'm not trusting it. Why? Because I'm looking at the reputation of the restaurant based on the reviews that people gave it. Everybody has a certain belief or an opinion about a restaurant and, and its service, about its food, about its atmosphere. And-, and what do we do? We get online and we look at the Google reviews to see the reputation of a restaurant, especially one that's outside of this city, and to see if if we want to go there or not. Reputation, here's what we understand in society, that reputations can be good, uh, but they can also be bad. Simply put, a reputation is what people think about you. Whether it's true or whether it's false, a reputation is what people think about you. It's their opinion of you. Reputation, here's what we know, is reputation, it can open doors. A good reputation can open doors that could have never been opened before. A reputation can provide you with clients. It can initiate friendships. It can initiate networking opportunities in the business world. In the secular world, good reputation is a very good thing. And here's what we know. Y'all know this being in Russell County. A good reputation in a small town is going to follow you pretty much the rest of your life, right? In fact, even if you don't have a good reputation, if you have a bad reputation in a small town, your reputation is going to follow you. That's just small town living. Reputations are important. Let me explain it this way. When I was in the sixth grade, I grew up in a small town of Russellville, Kentucky. When I grew up, I had a good friend. His name was Bryce. Bryce was a good old country boy. He had moved from the country school to the city school, and he was as nice as anybody could be. One day, Bryce doesn't show up to school for a few weeks. He doesn't show up to school, and so he, he then comes almost a week later, and we said, Bryce, where were you? What happened? And, and good old Bryce, he said, man, boys, he said, I got the bug. Now, small town. We all know what the bug is. We get the bug. Somebody, there's probably some people missing today because they got the bug. We don't know what the bug is. Uh, Dr. Jones, do you know what the bug is? I, The bug is something, but here's the point. He said, I got the bug. Now, the class clown heard this. And the class clown, he begins busting out in his high-pitched voice, and he begins laughing, and we're like, Terry, what's so funny? And immediately, he took what Bryce said, I got the bug, and he yells out, Bryce, you got bugs? (laughs) Ha, ha, ha. And and immediately the cold class, you know how sixth graders are, and they're just dying laughing. Bryce has got bugs. Here's what happened. That reputation followed him all throughout middle school on the football team because guess what his nickname became? Bugs. That was his nickname. Now, he was a good sport. He took it well. We all had weird nicknames at Russellville. That was just a thing. But, But here's what I'm saying. A reputation can follow you. Good reputations are hard to earn. Bad reputations are hard to overcome. Reputations are like water buffaloes. Y'all didn't watch Veggie Tales? Did anybody in here not watch Veggie Tales growing up? All right, everybody needs to get saved today. We'll do this. All right, so, so growing up watching Veggie Tales as a good Baptist kid, uh, I'd go to Lifeway. My parents would sit me there. Veggie Tales has a song. Everybody's got a water buffalo. Y'all heard that song? All right, y'all need to watch it. It's good. YouTube it. So here's the thing. Reputations. Johnny, you know what I'm talking about. You're, you're a preacher's kid. Everybody's got a water buffalo. Reputations. Guess what? Everybody's. I'm disappointed in this church. Everybody's got one, (laughs) including churches. Churches have reputations as well. You know, it's uh, it's important to have a good reputation in the community. Reputation is what... Um, it's not the most important thing, but a good reputation in the community is what allows maybe non-believers or, or guests to maybe they hear something good that's happened at First Baptist and they want to check it out. A good reputation brings people in the doors and gives them the opportunity to hear the gospel. But church, listen to me. We're talking about reputation, but reputation is not the most important thing. Good reputations are good. Don't get me wrong. It, it, I want our church to have a good reputation. But a good reputation is not the most important thing for me as a pastor, and it's not the most important thing for Jesus Christ. Christian, what could be more important than a good reputation? Reality. 
Here's our main purpose. If you're taking notes, just write this down. Here's the main purpose of this entire sermon. Reality is greater than reputation. Reality, it is greater than than our reputation. Reality, it is greater than other people's assumptions about us. Because guess what? Reality is what Jesus Christ looks at. Yes, Jesus hears about the reputations. He knows everybody's reputation, but reality is his focus. Look with me. Uh, If you go back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 23, we didn't have time to cover it uh, because of the length of the letter last week. But notice in Revelation 2, 23, notice what Jesus says. Jesus says these words. He says, I'm the one who searches mind and heart. I'm the one who searches mind and heart. From this, we get two principles. Principle number one is this. Jesus knows the reality of our hearts. He does. He knows the reality of who we truly are. He knows the reality of who we truly are as a person. But check this out. Principle number two, because Jesus knows the reality of our hearts, Jesus knows the reality of of our spiritual condition. There's no hiding anything from Christ. He knows the reality. Mark chapter 2, verse 8, it says, Immediately Jesus, who was aware in his spirit, he said to them, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? In other words, Jesus looks directly through the person and looks straight at the heart. He knew the hearts of these individuals. Think about the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 23, the famous chapter, it's the woes to the Pharisees. Jesus is giving different woes to the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 25, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate. But the inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the, what, inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside may be clean too. Church, what is Jesus saying? Jesus, we understand, looks past our reputation, and he looks straight to our reality. And the reality for the church in Sardis is this, the re, or the reputation for the church in Sardis was that they were alive. This was their reputation. They were alive. Now, the reputation of them being alive could mean two things. Two things. Number one, the reputation that they were alive could mean that at one time, Jesus recognized that they were a great church. The the reputation of them being alive, this could be that Jesus is recognizing that, hey, the church of Sardis, you were a church at one time, you were on fire for the Lord. You you were a church, man, man, you were a church that, man, it was the happening church. Things were happening. Y'all heard people say this phrase. Man, God was moving in that church. By Jesus saying that the church in Sardis had a reputation, more than likely, it's possible at the very least, is he is saying, man, at one time, the church in Sardis was alive. God was moving. People were coming to Christ. People were, were worshiping and serving. This could have been the reputation. Now, on the flip side, it also could have meant that the church in Sardis simply just always seemed like a good church. Christian, what do you mean? The church of Sardis could have been filled with programs and activities and events. And and on the outside looking in, it looked like they were the happening church, that, that this was a great church, but their reality, well, look what Jesus says in chapter three about their reality. He says, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. You have the reputation, church, of being alive, but but Sardis, Jesus gives these terrifying words and this terrible terrible pronunciation of this church. He says, look, church, I pronounce you dead. Let's ask this question, and let's talk about the state of the church in America for a little bit. How many churches, maybe if I ask you the question, how many churches in America are dead or dying today? You know, think about that for a moment. How many churches in America are dead or dying today? I tried to look for statistics online, and it's hard to find numbers because it takes so long to do these studies, and it's hard to find exact numbers for 2023. Here's what I found. In 2019, approximately 3,000 Protestant churches were started in the United States. All right? So so let's just say 3,000 churches were started, but then this study goes on to say, and this was a study done by Lifeway, 3,000 churches were started, but 4,500 churches died. So So if you do the math, what does that mean? In the year 2019, we lost 1,500 churches. Even though we started 3,000, we didn't gain. We lost 1,500 churches. And so what does this mean for the church? This was 2019. Y'all know 2020. 2020 had a huge impact on the church. 
In most churches, it had a negative impact on the church and on attendance and on salvations and baptisms. It had a bad impact. And so if this was done in 2019, what's our prediction for the church in the future? Church, I've been wrestling with this in in staff meetings and uh, with the deacons. I've been talking to them about these kind of these kind of numbers and these kind of ideas, what does that mean for the church today? In Russell County, there are, I've heard the number 120. I know, I've counted for sure there's at least 80 churches just in Russell County. So let's just say there's 100 churches in Russell County. I don't want to get up here and throw you a stat on what I think will happen to the church in the next 15 years in Russell County. But, but let's just say if there's 100 churches in, in Russell County, I do, I, I truly, and I'm not just, I'm not a prophet, so I don't, exactly hold my word for it, but based on the evidence of what we see and based on current trends, more than likely that number in Russell County, uh, let's just say we're at 100 churches in this county, more than likely in the next 15 to 20 years, that number is going to plummet. And I think it's very possible. I'm not saying it's for certain, but I could see that even in the next 15 years, that 25% of the churches in Russell County would close their doors. Now, Now, Christian, why do you say that? Well, sadly, I believe due to the current trends, this could happen. We've seen this happen before. Um, If you're a guest at this church, uh, there is a a ministry and there's an opportunity that God has provided at First Baptist, and that is the church at Indian Hills. Uh, Jarek just left the church at Indian Hills. Y'all had service today, didn't you? Did you preach the word this morning? Was there worship this morning? Amen. All right, so so Jarek, he goes and preaches at, at Indian Hills. This was a church that at one time had died. See, we know the reality of the church at Indian Hills. At once, it was a church where ministry was happening. And I believe great ministry was happening at this church at one time. But because for whatever the circumstances, I don't know the exact circumstances, but they'd gotten down to three people, and then eventually they closed their doors. Church, this is a reality that's already happening in our county, and this happened four years ago. Now, praise be to God that we have the opportunity to take the church of Indian Hills and ministry is still happening. And guess what? We still have the goal that hopefully in the next five years that the church of Indian Hills would become a self-sustaining, autonomous church. That's the goal. The goal is for us not to do summer ministry at Indian Hills. The goal that it would become an established church and would become its own church. That's the goal. And you know what? I think that's a good idea because here's what I believe is going to happen. And as I talk with my, 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 my pastor buddies and kind of we're looking at the demographics and, and what's going to happen, I think we're going to see more opportunities like what happened at the church at Indian Hills. If trends go the way they continue to look, I think there's going to be more opportunities. So what does that mean? If you walk outside our offices in the back, there is a wall. And it says, here at RS1, we want to make leaders, disciples, and churches that make what? Leaders, disciples, and churches. Here's what I'm saying. We don't know what exactly it'll look like, but the opportunity for us to continue to go into churches is going to be there. And so here's what we have to ask. Are we willing to continue to step up and see that revitalization, to see that reviving of a church that has died? Now, we, it's not our hope that any church would die. That, that's, not, that's not the case, but it is the reality. Let me read you a few more stats for us to get an understanding of the state of the church. Pew Research did a study, and they estimated that in 2020, all right, let's get a little nerdy for a little bit. Y'all, y'all good to get a little nerdy? Let's talk numbers. In the year 2020, about 64% of Americans, including children, were Christians. This has significantly dropped from, I think, 1972 when this number was about 90%. All right, we see the significant drop. 64% of Americans, including children, are Christians now in the year 2020. But now, here's what's interesting. There's a new group arising in America. Do y'all know who they are? The nuns. Not the... N-U-N-S, nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, nuns. Christian, what, what do you mean? What, what do you, who are the nuns? The nuns are the religious unaffiliated. They're not Buddhist. They're not Hindu. They're not Muslim. They're not Jewish. They're not Christian. They're just religiously unaffiliated. Check this stat out. In the year 2020, the nuns accounted for 30% of the United States population. Isn't that wild? of the population would then fall under Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, or other religion. Now, here's what the projections show. This was a study done by Pew Research. There's several different possibilities, but here's what the projections show. It says that Christians of all ages uh, will probably shrink from 64%, which is about two-thirds of the population of America, 
they will shrink from two-thirds of the population to more than likely at 54% or 35%, somewhere in between there. So, so Christian, what does that mean? More than likely, if trends continue, what's going to happen is two-thirds of a Christian world is then going to shrink to either half or, if worse, one-third of the entire United States population. And there's a high possibility that if things don't change, the nuns, check this out, over that same time period, Pew Research writes, the nuns would rise from currently at 30% to somewhere between 34 to 52%. What does that mean? What that means is, and their, the projected numbers was for the year 2070. So if nothing changed and trends continued the same as they are, what would happen was the rise of the nuns would then meet with the Christian number. As Christians come down, the nuns come up, they would then meet somewhere. And more than likely by the year 2070, we would see the nuns passing Christianity in population in the United States. Maybe you didn't realize the state of the church today but that's where it's at. Now, to not good news, but maybe worse news for that, there are those who between the ages of 18 to 29, and so my generation, uh, they self-designate uh, as atheist agnostic or no particular faith. In other words, they designate as a nun. Their number for people 18 to 29, their number is already at 39% uh, identify as a, well, they wouldn't identify as a nun, but they are considered a nun. I saw an article this week that Generation Z is the least religious generation. Now, let me say this, Gen Z. There's a lot of hope for Gen Z. In fact, we're seeing Gen Z more open to spirituality more than any other generation in a long time. There's good news for Gen Z, but it's going to take some strong men and women in the faith to share the gospel and be bold in their faith. So hold that for you guys that just got back from camp. But the younger generation, according to trends, who are growing up, the, Gen Z is the first generation to grow up in a post-Christian world. Do you guys realize that? The first generation to grow up in a post-Christian world, Generation Z will not attend church as much as their parents did, and they will definitely not as attend church as much as their grandparents, and they will for certainly not attend church as much as their great-grandparents did if this trend continues. And church... I don't think you have to be good at math to realize if this trend continues, what's going to happen? Churches are going to close their doors at rapid rates. That by the year 2070, when I'm 74 years old, the state of the church is going to be almost vacant. And so we're going to see that. Tom Rainer, he was former president and CEO of Lifeway. Now, he's a church consultant now. He wrote a famous book called Autopsy of a Dead Church. In this, he shares a story. There was once a church that had 750 people in the congregation. This church was booming. It, was, it had the reputation like Sardis. It was alive. But because they did not want to do the things they, they needed to do in order to get the gospel out, and they did not want, want to, to change things in order that people would, would come to church and have a relationship with Christ because of this, by the time Tom Rainer got there on a call as a church consultant, this church went from 750 people to 83. In other words, this church was not just dying, this church was lifeless. And as Tom Rainer was there, he says, if things don't change, this church will die in five years. He was wrong. It didn't take five years, but it did take ten years. This church eventually died. Why do I say this? Because this happens. Churches sometimes die. But you know what? It never just starts with the whole church. It always starts with individuals. What happens in our walk with Christ? We get excitement for God. Man, we get excitement for his word. There's times in our life where we're growing and then boom, what happens? It's like it all begins to fade. We had this excitement for Christ. We, we wanted to share our faith. We were, we were bold. And then all of a sudden, somewhere, something, I don't know what happens, but, but something, and we begin to, to get into this spiritual atrophy, right? Y'all know what atrophy is. You know, you can develop muscular atrophy if you don't use your muscles. And because we're not spiritually doing the things God has called, called us to, we fall into this spiritual atrophy. And we begin as Christians to waste away. This is what happened to the church of Sardis. The church in Sardis had a reputation of being alive, but Jesus pronounces their condition as dead. Here's the good news, though. As we read on through Revelation chapter 3, Jesus doesn't say you're dead, see you later, does he? 
No, he gives commands. Now, now, why are commands important? Here's what we're going to look. There's five commands that Jesus gives to the church in Sardis, and these are five steps to revival and spiritual awakening in this church. The good news of why Jesus brought commands and why that's good news for us, because if Jesus gives commands to a dead church, what does that mean, church? There's still what? There's still hope. That there's still hope in Jesus. He he doesn't say, okay, you're dead. You know what? I don't want nothing to do with you. You're the scum of the earth. I'm going on to the church of Philadelphia. No, he says, guess what? You're dead, but. You're dead, but but let me give you these five commands. And these five steps are what what Christ would tell the church in America today, what he would tell Russell Springs First Baptist and churches all around. These are the five things we need in order to experience revival and awakening. Number one, chapter three, verse two. Jesus says, wake up. This phrase, wake up, is translated to be alert, be watchful, pay attention. Hey, I was at Crossings. When I was working at Crossings, I'll tell you all this story. Y'all can listen to. When I was working at Crossings, I was on that main dock uh, right there. I was a lifeguard. And, and you know how the, the towers are, are, are really tall? I was sitting on there. And gosh, I never slept when I worked at Crossings, maybe like four hours. And so I'm on this dock, and I'm supposed to be watching the kids. And, and I'm sitting there, and man, the waves, they just start. And at dock, it just, and I don't do good about 2 o'clock in the afternoon anyways. If, if you walk in my office about 2 o'clock and you knock on it, you're waking me up. And so uh, I, I was on this dock, and I was, and I'm out. Well, all of a sudden, boom, I, I'm, ah, I'm screaming, I'm swimming. I, I'm like, oh, gosh, I just, this is so embarrassing. They're going to fire me. And all of a sudden, I, I open my eyes, and I realize, oh, thank God, I'm not under the water. But who was there? Roger Palmer. All right, so Roger Palmer was their camp pastor the past two years. And if you know Roger, you know his intensity. He was my boss at the time. He comes and he smacked me on the arm. And, and this dude, he's six years old, but he's pretty strong. He said, boom. He says, wake up. Wake up. And he was yelling at me. And so I wake up and I'm like, yes, sir, yes, sir. And I'm looking at the kids and, and man, I was awake the rest of the day. I didn't have to worry about that anymore. Church, this is what Jesus is doing. He's grabbing us by the arm and he's saying, church, you're dying. Wake up up. Wake up. We need a wake-up call to the reality of our condition. What does this take? Well, it takes us to assess our own spiritual condition. How do we assess our own spiritual condition? Well, we we really look at the fruit of our lives, and and we try to evaluate where are we at spiritually? Are, Are we where we should be? Are we where God is calling us to be? Here's one of the things when it comes to a spiritual assessment, what we need to do, we need to quit lying to ourselves. Church, we're lines of sin, we're not supposed to do it anyways, but sometimes as church people, we lie to ourselves and we're like, yeah, I'm okay. You know, I'm pretty good spiritually. I, I'm here at church every Sunday, so I'm pretty good. And we tell this lie that our spiritual lives are doing okay and our walk with Christ is simply okay just because we come to church or we are a member at First Baptist Russell Springs. We need to quit lying to ourselves and assess our true spiritual condition. We need to wake up because there is still Hope. Number two, Jesus says this. He says, strengthen what remains. Now, there were still good Christians in the church at Sardis, and we'll talk about that later. But but here's what Jesus says. He says, strengthen what remains. Let let me ask this question. As we think about revival and awakening, what areas of your life are currently weak right now? Not, Not physically, but what areas in your spiritual life are currently weak? Think about it this way. Maybe take your prayer life. Christian, I haven't, gosh, I haven't really just took the time to just pray. I pray before my meals and before I go to bed. Okay, that's good. I'm not saying that's bad, but what I'm saying is, have you took the time to just spend time in in prayer with God? If not, guess what Jesus says? Strengthen what remains. Strengthen your prayer life. Christian, man, I'm not a big reader, so I really don't spend a lot of time in, in God's word. Well, you can listen to it, but you know what? Just read it. Read the scripture, spend time with God, learn about who he is. Strengthen your Bible study. Strengthen your time alone with God. Strengthen what remains. And we could go on with several areas, but the point is this. What remains in your life spiritually right now, would you strengthen it? Jesus says, strengthen what remains. And then he says this. He says, for I have found your works uh, not complete in the sight of God. Number three, he says, remember then what you have received and heard. Step number three as we think about revival and awakening is to remember what you have received and what you have heard. Church, what have you received? What what have you heard? Well, the word of God, and more importantly, check this out, the gospel. 
You, you've heard the gospel. You've received the good news of Jesus Christ. Remember the good news that you received. Here's, what, here's the thing. We don't just remember the gospel. The gospel, this is important to know. The gospel is not for that moment in vacation Bible school where you hear a gospel presentation, you come to Christ, you get baptized, and then you never think about the gospel again. If that is your only time where you think about the gospel, then you might want to rethink some things. Why do I say that? The gospel is for everyday life for the Christian. The gospel, it is the good news. Every morning you wake up, you preach yourself the gospel. Man, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I thank you for saving me from my sins. I thank you for living a perfect life and dying on the cross for my sins and raising again from the grave. And God, I'm thankful that you're coming back one day. Preach yourself the gospel because guess what? If you understand the gospel and you remember the gospel every single day, it's going to change the way you live. So Jesus says, remember what you've received. Number four, he says, keep it. Obviously, obey the word of God. And then number five, you can't have revival without what? Repentance. You can't have revival without repentance. We can um, we think about what happened at Asbury and the spiritual awakening there. It started with students being repentant before God. Revival and spiritual awakening starts. Yes, we repent. When, when, we, when we're saved, we repent of our sins and turn to Jesus. But Christians, every single day is a day to practice repentance. We're not perfect. Guess what, church? Your pastor is, oh gosh, I'm so far from perfect. It's not even funny. I'm not perfect. So you know what I need every day? I need repentance. Every day I'm constantly turning from the things of the world, and I'm turning to God because guess what? We all still struggle. And so the key to revival is repentance. Now, let me say this. I'm, I know some, we, we, sometimes you can get revival messages, and, man, you can beat people over the head. I'm not here to beat you over the head. Neither is Jesus. Because here's what we see. He tells the truth, uh, and we understand that. He starts with clear reality, which is truth, and he can't help tell the truth because Jesus is truth. But notice Jesus also in verse 4, he says, Yet, you still have a few names in Sardis of people who have not soiled their garments. In other words, people who are not contaminated by sin, but they walk in white. In other words, they walk in the righteousness of Christ. Jesus is saying this, Sardis, you're dead, but there are still some faithful people in the church. And here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying everybody in this church is a terrible heathen. Yes, we're all sinners and we all fall short. But I understand there are people who are following Christ in this church. And I say thank you. We're not perfect. No, 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 nobody in this church is, is perfect, far from it. But there are people in churches, and Jesus even commends those in the church of Sardis who have not soiled their garments, who have stayed away from the sins of this world. And so we get to verse 5, and in verse 5, this is where we um, finish in verse 5. Jesus says, to the one who conquers. Each letter has had a statement, to the one who conquers, to the one who is, is saved by the grace of God, in other words. To the one who conquers, he will be clothed in there it is again, white garments. And Jesus says, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Luke chapter 10, verse 20, Jesus tells his disciples, they were excited about the ministry they were doing. And he tells them, do not rejoice because the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Church, there is something we look forward to. And it's the day we stand before God and, and he opens up the book of life and, and we hear our name called. The book of life is for all those who belong to God. The, the question we want to ask this morning is, you know, if you've been saved of your sins and uh, you've been saved by the grace of God, your name is in that book of life. I believe that 100%. But, you know, there might be someone here this morning who has not accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If you're here this morning, you say, Christian, I, I hear this message and, and I don't have a relationship with Christ. But I want my name to be written in that book of life. I, I, I want to experience the eternal life that Jesus offers. You know what? You can do that today. At the end of service, we're going to have a time of, of singing. And here's what I encourage you to do. Understand that Jesus loves you so much. He gave his self as a sacrifice for your sins he defeated death and rose again from the grave, and we understand he's coming back one day. Now, if you have not been saved and you have not put your trust in Jesus, I ask that you would do that this morning. There's no better time than this morning. I, I encourage you to come down and, and talk with me, and, and you just simply say, Christian, I need to be saved, and we'll have that conversation. It's the best decision you'll ever make. I encourage you to trust Jesus.
For the Christians this morning, let me finish with something. There was an evangelist by the name of Gypsy Smith, and he inspired something for me. And so Jesus, he gave five, he gave five steps to revival and spiritual awakening. Five steps to revival and spiritual awakening. Well, Gypsy Smith gives us another, uh, we'll call it a secret to revival. And don't worry, I'm not going to do it. I can't even hula hoop. Uh, I don't know why. I just, I can't do it. I don't understand the physics behind it. But uh, I'll learn one day. And so, uh, not today. And so, I got this hula hoop to to represent something. uh, Because this hula hoop is going to represent the the secret to revival. Uh, and, And it's not something weird. It's not like, oh, I got this secret that no one knows about. Uh, th- this is obvious, and uh, Jesus would agree with this statement. In fact, we've already talked about this in a message already. But, but Christian, how do, we, how do we see revival in our church? Lord, I don't want to see the church trends for 2070 come true. You know what? At Russell Springs First Baptist Church, I don't want to see the church trends come true in our county. I don't, I don't want to see death on any church. I do not want to see that. I want to see spiritual revival here at First Baptist, and I want it to spread throughout the entire county. So, Christian, how does it happen? Well, if you follow the five things, I guarantee it will happen. But just in case you need something, you just need something like, Christian, there's got to be something else. Here it is. You ready? I want you to take a hula hoop. And if you don't have a hula hoop, you can go outside and you can get a piece of chalk. You can get some string. Whatever you do, I want you to make a circle, all right? So, so I want you to come. And, and let me have um, Jay Helm come up here real quick. Would you come up here? Man, you got on the end of the row. I'm so sorry. It's, don't sit on the end. Squeeze the middle, make room for people. All right, so, so Jay comes in. Jay, I just want you to stand in that circle. All right, I watched a magician the other day. No, I'm not going to make you do anything crazy. I just want you to stand in that circle. Church, here's the secret to revival. Jay, all I'm going to ask you to do, and you don't have to do it now, but you'll understand in a minute. All you have to do, and this is under the inspiration of evangelist Gypsy Smith, he said this, if you want revival, all you have to do is, Jay, I want you to just draw a circle, get a hula hoop. I want you to stand in that circle. And Jay, I just want you to pray for revival for every single person in that circle. That's it, all right? You don't have to do it now. I want you to pray for revival for every single person, Jay, but only in that circle, okay? You think you could do that? All right, Jay, go sit down. Give me somebody else. Um, Alden Brumley, come up here. I see he put his head down. I saw, if you wouldn't put your head down, I wouldn't have called on you. Alden, look, the, the circle don't even have to be on stage, all right? Alden, stand in that circle. If you can't see him, he's in the circle. Alden, all you have to do to see revival happen in, in this church is you need to pray. God, send revival to everybody in that circle. You think you could do that at home? All right, you go sit down. Who else wants to come? Let's get, we, we, need to pick on, we need to pick on somebody else. We want to, Matt Emerson, stand in that circle. It don't even have to be at the front. Of, back row Baptists can even have revival. This is the great thing. Matt, all you have to do is pray for revival to break out in everybody in that circle. Could you do that? Amen. All right, stand out of that circle. All right, just in case, Tony, because sometimes they don't believe back row Baptists can be saved. Tony, could you stand in that circle? I want you to pray for everybody in that circle that God would revive them. Could you do that? All right, you do that. Church, here's the thing about revival. It starts with the individual. It starts with individuals in the church. And we pray, Lord, send revival to our nation. Yes, we want that. No, send revival to who? Me. Father. God. We ask this morning. God, I'm just going to pray right now for me. Lord, I pray you'd send revival inside of me, Lord. God, I pray you'd send revival in everybody that's inside this hula hoop right now. Lord, that your will would be done in my life. God, send revival and awakening. Help me turn from my sins and turn to you, Jesus. In your name, amen. If you need to make a decision this morning, we're going to sing one last song. Church, I encourage you to pray. Most importantly, pray for revival for you. As we close today, if you want to make a decision or you want to join the church, I Um, I encourage you as soon as the music starts playing to come, let's stay in worship.
may be seated. Um, Aaron, would you guys like to come up this morning? The Canes are coming this morning with their two lovely children, beautiful daughters. Uh, this is Aaron and Jessica Kane. They have become a staple uh, in our community. Um, many of you know uh, the great work that they do uh, within Russell County. Uh, and we've been talking, Aaron and Jessica, they come to join our church uh, this morning. And if you rejoice in that decision, would you rejoice by saying amen? Amen. 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 We're excited for what God's going to do in you guys. Uh, you are an amazing couple, and you have some beautiful girls. And we're excited to see what God does in them. And so here's what I'm going to do. They're going to come with me out to the back. I encourage you to come and congratulate uh, Aaron and Jessica and the girls. Uh, and as we see them, uh, just take root here at First Baptist Church. That's all the announcements, announcements men. Remember, even if it's storming, we're still going to have, I mean, unless it's a tornado, we're still going to have the event tonight. Uh, and so we encourage you guys to come out. Uh, Jeff, would you sing us out this morning? Mm -hmm. 